to a tutorial on the functions related to thyroid hormones. So this is going to include information that ties to the tutorial that was produced that looks at the different endocrine glands of the body and how they are related. So the functions of thyroid stimulating hormone and of thyroid hormones themselves is to increase metabolism. Now as an introductory student when I looked at metabolism I thought oh yeah it's that thing that increases reactions and decreases reactions. But as a student I missed the idea of what metabolism is and what sort of effects metabolism can have across the body. The main link to metabolism here is an increased protein synthesis. But this increased protein synthesis is related to the increase in enzymes. And enzymes are proteins. So the functions of these hormones are to engage the nuclear information in the process of transcription, which will then be followed by translation into proteins. In addition, we see all sorts of other effects across the body that are related to metabolism. And that, in part, is going to control body temperature regulation. Okay, so we're going to play 20 questions. But really, it's only going to be three. And really, we're in the middle of a tutorial that's discussing thyroid hormones. So you might be able to take a leap of faith here and figure out what these are. So the first question is, what endocrine gland gets more blood supply than any other? Well, if you guessed the thyroid gland, you would be correct. The thyroid gland is the endocrine organ that has a greater vascular supply than any of the other tissues. This is going to be related to metabolism. If metabolism is important in driving the engine of the body, then it would make some intuitive sense that the gland that's going to be in control needs to get adequate blood supply in order to do its job and to make sure that when the signal is released to increase metabolism, the thyroid gland can respond. Here's a question that's a little more complex than on first glance. What endocrine organs can malfunction and cause people to gain weight? Well, of course, we're talking about the thyroid gland here and thyroid hormones. So if you made that leap of faith that a problem with the thyroid gland can cause you to gain weight, you're absolutely correct. So there are issues with thyroid hormones that cause people to gain weight. There's also issues with thyroid hormones that cause people to lose weight. But in addition to the thyroid gland, there are other glands that can malfunction causing weight gain. For example, when the pancreas malfunctions, we can see some weight gain issues. When growth hormone is secreted, we see changes in the amounts of circulating blood glucose, and that can cause some weight gain. Cortisol and its stress hormone also will cause people to gain weight or maintain their weight. And in addition to that, we can't forget epinephrine. Epinephrine is going to have an effect on circulating blood glucose levels. And the purpose of epinephrine is to increase blood glucose levels so there's an energy supply available for the tissues. So there are several glands in the endocrine system that can malfunction and have a direct impact on blood glucose amounts, which will then have an effect on weight gain. Okay, last question. What endocrine gland is dependent on iodine to create its hormones? At this point, I hope you remember that iodine is a mineral that is very important to the body and that deficiencies in iodine mean that the thyroid gland cannot make the hormones T3 and T4. Remember that the prefix of these names is triiodo or tetraiodo. So it's talking about the number of iodines that are attached to the molecule. So let's take a little journey on what hormones we need and where they're produced to release thyroid hormones. There are three hormones that need to be initially released in order to get activity at the tissues. First, thyroid releasing hormone must be secreted. That will cause thyroid stimulating hormone to be released. That'll be followed by T4 and T3. So these are the three different hormone groups that have to be released in sequence before we can engage a response out at the tissues. It takes approximately a week to see any impact. The thyroid releasing hormone comes from the hypothalamus, which triggers the anterior pituitary via this little capillary network that is connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. 
once the pituitary gland releases thyroid stimulating hormone this enters into circulation but quickly arrives at the thyroid because the thyroid gland is the most vascular endocrine gland in the body that will cause the thyroid gland to produce the thyroid hormones which are t3 and t4 t3 and t4 are going to be in circulation in two forms the first is some of the t3 and t4 will go directly into circulation and be dissolved in the plasma this is known as free thyroid hormones and these free hormones have the ability to bind to receptors and get into the tissues now on the flip side much of the t4 is bound to plasma proteins so the combination of bound proteins versus the free proteins allows the body to maintain a relatively constant level of thyroid hormones now the t4 is bound to two types of proteins in blood you have three proteins albumin globulins and fibrinogen about 20 to 30 percent of the thyroxine or t4 is bound to albumin because albumin is the most abundant form of protein that we have in the blood Globulins are the second most abundant form of protein in the blood, and we actually find thyroxine binding globulins binding to somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of the thyroxine. So this works on the principle of diffusion. If the free circulating levels of these hormones go down, then the plasma proteins can distribute some of their bound hormone into the blood to help maintain a constant level. Now, T3 and T4 are a specific and unique type of protein, a unique amino acid derivative that has both soluble and insoluble states. And what is unique about this particular amino acid is that it has the capacity to move across the plasma membrane and enter into the cell, acting like a lipid-soluble molecule. Okay, so let's spend a little time talking about the thyroid gland and what the thyroid gland does. So we know that the thyroid gland controls metabolism, and that's going to be related to the catabolic and anabolic reactions related to carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Of course, deficiencies in any of this, these areas could lead to fatigue in the individual. Now, metabolism is more than just processing these large major macromolecules. Because it's a chemical reaction, we find that heat is given off, when metabolism takes place. So temperature is a function of the thyroid as it relates to changes in metabolism. So this increase in metabolism will elevate the temperature and a decrease in metabolism will depress the temperature. So dependent upon whether the metabolism is high or low, we will see either heat sensitivities if it's high and cold sensitivities if it's low. The thyroid hormone also has effects on growth. This has a direct effect on tissues, causing the growth of tissues. But thyroid hormones also have an indirect effect on the hypothalamus, starting the pathway that releases growth hormone. So the thyroid hormones and the growth hormones are linked. In addition, the thyroid plays an integral role of the nervous system. This occurs both developmentally as well as in the adult. So developmentally, certain amounts of thyroid hormone need to be in circulation in order for the central nervous system to grow and develop. And if levels of thyroid hormone are low, we will see decreased amounts of mental activity and potentially mental retardation. Now in the adult, those thyroid hormones are just important in driving the chemical reactions in the synapses, the energy in those synapses. An individual suffering from low levels of thyroid hormone will suffer from memory issues as well as cognitive issues, difficulty focusing, for example. Now, this is something that is related to the thyroid gland, not the thyroid hormones. The thyroid gland also has cells that are going to regulate and help change blood calcium levels. Thyroid hormone will have an effect on heart and lung function. Much of this is driven by the metabolism that we started with. If the metabolic rate of the tissues increases, there's going to be an increased demand for oxygen and nutrients for the cells to support that increase in function. So the heart and lungs have to increase their rate in order to perfuse the tissues. Then vice versa, if the metabolic rate decreases, then we don't need as many nutrients and oxygen out at the tissue, so the heart rate and the lung rate will depress.
We find that the thyroid hormone has an effect on moisture in the skin. If we don't have enough thyroid hormone, the skin will be dry. And if we have too much thyroid hormone, we can see this sweating and this very moist skin. The last link, and what I'm afraid I don't understand very well, is the link to menstruation. We do know that thyroid hormones have an effect on the female's menstrual cycle, and individuals who go through deficiencies in thyroid hormones may find themselves having heavier and prolonged periods. So let's look at the hypo and hyper secretions. For hyposecretion, there are several things that can cause this. It can be a breakdown anywhere in the system of thyroid releasing hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, or the thyroid hormones themselves. Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune reaction that damages the thyroid. This will cause hyposecretion. In addition, if the pituitary gland fails, then I lack the thyroid stimulating hormone that's going to target the thyroid and increase thyroid hormones. If the thyroid was removed, which may be necessary in the case of hypersecretion, then these patients will suffer from hyposecretion and will have to use supplementation in order to keep their metabolism up. Dietary iodine is very important in the production of T3 and T4. So an individual who doesn't have sufficient iodine in their diet may see a hyposecretion, not because the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland are damaged, but because there isn't the precursor mineral needed to make the active form T3 and the inactive form T4. And then lastly, exposure to drugs or chemicals that bind to the same sites that thyroid stimulating hormone would bind to can create a hyposecretion. So anything that acts as an antagonist at the thyroid gland will cause a hyposecretion. The signs and symptoms are what you would expect with a decreased metabolism. Decreased metabolic rate means a cooler than normal body temperature and cold intolerance, weight gain, and a reduced appetite. The heart and lung function will depress. We'll see lower rates because there isn't the need or the demand based on the metabolic rate. The muscles are going to be fatigued. This includes cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle. And when we see smooth muscle fatigue, we see things like constipation in the gastrointestinal system. And then when we're looking at the nervous system, we see that these individuals may be fairly apathetic. They may lack energy. They will have memory issues and cognition issues. They just may not be able to think. I just, I can't think about it. I don't get it. We also see dry skin, heavier than normal periods, and in some of these individuals, we may see a goiter. Now, these symptoms are not necessarily all going to be manifested in an individual that has a hyposecretion. It relates to the cause of the hyposecretion and the state of the disease. So somebody who's early in the hyposecretion may find that they're gaining a little bit of weight and that they're a little bit cold, but they may not be having the cognitive issues, for example. Now the hypersecretions may be caused by Graves' disease in which the thyroid is overactive. It may be caused by the thyroid being inflamed like thyroiditis. Tumors, such as a tumor of the thyroid may cause hypersecretion, but also tumors that would affect the pituitary gland and cause a hypersecretion of thyroid stimulating hormone. And then this last one, thyroid storm, is something that is not particularly well understood in the medical field, but it does cause across the board increased activity at the thyroid. Now what sort of effects do we see? The opposite of hyposecretion. This person's going to have an increased metabolic rate, a really high body temperature, and not tolerate heat very well. They're going to be skinny because they're going to be losing weight due to this increased metabolic rate, and their appetite will increase because they need more fuel in the system. We're also going to see elevated heart rate and respiratory rate to try to keep up with its increased metabolic demand as well as sweating, higher body temperatures, we've got to cool this system down, we're going to have a lot of moisture out in that skin. We're going to have weak muscles here as well, but it's for the opposite reason. In the previous slide, it was because they didn't have enough energy to drive the muscles. But here we have weak muscles because they're jittery, they're tremors, they're overly excited. We may also see diarrhea in this individual due to that increased activity of smooth muscle. So an increased effect on the rate of movement through the GI tract. And then a common symptom that we see with Graves' disease is exophthalmos. This is where the eyes kind of bulge out of the optic cavity. 
These individuals from a nervous system standpoint are going to seem hyperactive. They're going to have a lot of activity, this overactivity in the brain, which may even cause difficulty of sleeping. And we almost always see a goiter when we have hypersecretion. 